My name is Wing. Uh, I'm a relatively new to geospatial. Uh, I'm not a geospatial expert by any means, uh, but I am a front-end developer and uh, I've kind of chosen to apply this to geospatial, the, the, the learnings that I have from being a front-end developer. Uh, I work at CSR Startup 61 uh, back in Australia. Uh, and if you have any questions that we can't get to during question time, uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, on that handle, at SoySauce. So when I read my own talk title, <laughs> I kind of realized it was a bit confusing. So uh, I'll kind of pre uh, preface this with a bit of what this talk isn't going to be about. It's not about how to encode or describe your data. It's purely to expose the data that you've already got handy. Uh, the next one is we're not unearthing any data that doesn't exist. Um, we can't really pull data out of thin air, although that's almost what we're doing here. Uh, but I, <laughs> it'll make sense. <laughs> it'll make sense um, once we get into it. Um, uh, we're not exposing any data that's not accessible by a web browser. So Terrier takes data and kind of makes it displayed in a web browser. So that's that's the sort of data that we'll be surfacing. Uh, and we're not making your open source code base discoverable. I'm not going to tell you any like growth hack tips on how to, you know, get more stars on your GitHub repo. But uh, you know, if you know how to do that, you can tell me. <laughs> so. Uh, what it will be about is we're going to be talking about uh, how we began our journey into how we made Terrier more discoverable. Uh, Terrier is a JavaScript web app. Um, and how we kind of did this while maintaining our open source ethos. So we wanted to um, uh, apply an approach that kind of worked with the, the way that we worked in, in the open. Uh, the technique will be as broad as possible, so this will kind of be broadly applicable to every single single page app out there, uh, and uh, staying free. So we, we didn't want to make it cost anything ad anything additional to kind of run a Terrier map. We just wanted to uh, not add more add this new cool thing without having to increase the cost. Uh, and I'll give a crash course in search engines or, or web crawlers. So I need to firstly tell you a little bit about Terrier, uh, which is a web geospatial visualization tool that runs in your browser. Uh, it's a single page application. And when I say single page, I, s I mean it. So like this literally right here, everything that you see here is everything Terry is. So you've got like a map on the right hand side uh, and you've got like a kind of UI toggles on the left hand side that kind of change what you see on the right hand side. Uh, there's no notion of a separate page. However, we do have this thing called the data catalog. Uh, it's a, essentially it's a tree structure of um, a bunch of data sets that you might want to curate and show to your users. Uh, and you can only access this catalog uh, by clicking this add data button that's just you know in the top left. <laughs> right. So that, that right there is a HTML button. Uh, so search engines. That is um, a, th they're pretty big. So one of the first points of calls that we have when we uh, have a query or a question is we immediately think of, oh, I'll just go and Google it, or Bing it, or DuckDuckGo, or whatever it is that you like to do. Um, so given that, I will, I think it's pretty important to kind of understand how they work or how they view things on the web. Uh, this is a very contrived example. The HTML that's there doesn't really matter. It's just there for example's sake. So search engines do a thing called web crawling, where they, um, they, they crawl your website. And so let's just say we have this three-page website. Uh, it's got some some content on it, uh, and more importantly, there's a couple of uh, a tags or some some links to more pages on your website. So the engine will uh, the web crawler will go and see this page, your homepage, and it'll be like, oh look, there's more links to more pages. I'm going to go to those pages, uh, and so you know it will go and visit reallyamazingthing.com slash great data set, uh, and then do the exact same thing. It'll kind of loop through and kind of crawl across your uh, website to. Get a, get a picture of what it is that you've got on your, your website. So this is what a search engine result page would look like for a, this three-page website. Uh, and again, this is a really basic example. It's, it's a you know, bunch of HTML pages that we've kind of linked together. Search engines really only want to serve relevant, useful, and meaningful data information to its users. I look at Terrier. This is going back to Terrier. I look at this, and I'm, I can't. I'm thinking, where's the meaningful content? I can't really, there's nothing for me to serve up to the search engines, right? How do we even make a map like this uh, indexable or, or have data for search engines to, to crawl? Well, there isn't, 
and that's why I kind of pointed so much in, uh, attention to this add data bit, because that's the part in our application where we can, it, it's like a gateway to a whole bunch of information that we, we that is basically invisible to search engines. Uh, we could surface this, there's this whole bunch of data and, and more for each of the data sets that we have in Terrier. Uh, and some of the Terrier maps that we have have hundreds and, and even thousands of data, uh, data sets that, you know, are completely invisible, uh, like this, it boggled my mind. So, of course, we went, uh, set out to fix it. Uh, and so going back to static HTML sites, um, it's 2019, the Terrier is in a static HTML website. Uh, it's all about the single page apps now. So let's see what the HTML looks like for a single page app. Uh, it's a HTML. <laughs> it's got a, you know, one lonely div in the middle right there. So it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> hello, I'm a div of ID app. Uh, so that gets served up uh, and uh, its sole purpose in life is to wait there for your JavaScript to be parsed and downloaded and ready so that your JavaScript will go in and take over and bring that div to life, right? Uh, notice that we don't have any anchor tags or any links to other pages on this, so the search engine is like, oh, pff, this is just one page. Uh, I'm done crawling this website. So it, it literally can't see all the other pages. Uh, so if a search engine sees a link to your website from someone else's website, they'll go and visit it, but it's the same thing. Like if you hit your page at this with a, uh, a search engine, it's the same thing. There's more empty divs or you know, blank pages, essentially. Uh, and so again, in 2019, we're, we're like, oh, we're done away with HTML. We want a div ID of app, right? We're all building our applications like the bottom on, on the right there. So apps that rely on HTML, like Slack, which was mentioned earlier, uh, if you don't know what it is, it's an instant messaging application. Um, the, the, their website says most links will automatically expand to show a preview of the web page, right? Slack doesn't know what to do with a div ID of app. Like it needs to see actual content on there for it to preview to you because it's not going to run JavaScript to you know, parse everything. Uh, similarly, it's the same for search engines. So they will not know anything about your thing because they, they just see empty content, same with Slack. You can have the most richest and most extensive data on your website. Uh, it'll just be invisible. Your, it's going to be just, no one is going to know about it. Uh, people can't Google it because that's how they get data or get information, and I think that's really unfortunate. So you might be sitting there and thinking, well, oh, wait, really? I mean, you're, you're, that, that can't be true. Uh, that's fake news. Um, what's the point of doing all this work if nobody can find it, right? Surely the machines are smarter. Surely, surely, right? Unfortunately, it is true. Uh, Google will say that, it, oh, yes, we can index JavaScript, but <laughs> that's a... Uh, fallacy. Uh, it's it's true to some extent, but it will take weeks and weeks and weeks on end, uh, and it won't do it perfectly because it's JavaScript, right? Uh, <laughs> we uh, other uh, big search engines out there, Bing, they completely you know fall flat when you're they're trying to crawl uh, single page apps. They're, they're, it's the same thing. Um, they see nothing, right? Uh, again, other applications like Slack or social media, uh, even when you're sharing links on there, that's the same thing. It's like it can't, it can't do anything when there's nothing for it to, um, to preview. So thankfully, we have a solution for this, right? So it's called server-side rendering. You might be eerily familiar with this, right? Throughout the history of the web, we've gone from static HTML pages linked together uh, to HTML pages that get rendered out by PHP, like, which is the server-side dynamic um, HTML templating language, uh, which was supported by a big part of the web. And we've gone all the way through to doing everything we did in PHP, but in JavaScript. So we've gone full circle all the way back to JavaScript. And uh, this, is, this is the state of things if you want to fix this. Server-side rendering, what is it? Uh, it is ridiculously hard. It's bloody hard. Um, you, it, it fundamentally changes the way that you architect your code. You kind of have to uh, think about a whole lot of things including whether you're running in the browser or on the server, uh, whether you have like web APIs ready, uh, available to use, or if you're just running in the Node environment. Uh, and just remember, it's really bloody hard, right? All the, and, and so, yes, it's hard, but it's hard for a reason, uh, because JavaScript. Uh, but mainly, uh, the benefits that you get out of doing it is uh, you get great UX benefits. Uh, you get fast first paint. So what I mean by that is you, uh, it's, once you serve up HTML to the browser, uh, the, the browser can immediately parse that and it can show you, uh, something meaningful to the, to the users instead of having to wait and stare at a blank page. 
while the JavaScript gets downloaded, parsed, etc. Uh, search engines can index your site, right? So once you get this done, uh, search engines can index. There are some downsides, slow time to first byte, meaning uh, now your web server has, has to go and render and parse your JavaScript before your user even sees anything, because your user's requesting the page and the server's like, oh, okay, hang on, wait a minute, I need to render this first. Slow time to interactive. Uh, what this means is you get a bunch of HTML, uh, but you can't really do anything with it until the JavaScript gets parsed, because that's what the role of JavaScript is, to bring kind of interactivity to your, web, your, your page. I, think, I still think that's better than you know, staring at a blank white page while you know, if you're on a really slow connection, that's just a really poor experience, right? And just remember, it's really hard. So how do we get all of these benefits without having to do the hard yards? Uh, it's not feasible for any of us at this conference to kind of walk away and you know, go back to work and be like, oh, okay, we're going to server side rendering everything. Uh, there's an easier way. Let me tell you about it. It's called pre-rendering. Uh, this is our golden savior, right? Overview, less stupidly hard. We get all the benefits of server-side server rendering and more, um, and more meaning we don't have that slow time to first byte. Uh, the server doesn't have to do any um, thinking when your users are requesting pages because it already has the HTML ready to, to deliver. It just has to uh, serve that down the pipe. Uh, a lot less architectural changes, right? Um, and, and it's basically really bloody easy. Uh, so easy that I can explain it to you in three steps, right? Pre-rendering 101. So use a headless browser to render out all your pages, your routes, uh, store your HTML, and then you serve that back up. It's that simple. Um, I'll break that down a little bit more. <laughs> so headless browser and, and store HTML, that's kind of um, two steps together, uh, happens at the same time. This is the, the pre-rendering part, where you take a headless browser, and you uh, hit all your routes as if you're a search engine uh, because you want to kind of create an image on your own server of what your website looks like. And you kind of save the results of that uh, into HTML. Uh, Webpack allows you to do all of this, and it's all bundled up nicely into a little plugin. Uh, but basically, that's what it does under the hood, right? Number three is configure your web server to serve up that HTML. So you make your homepage serve up your your original index.html that has some pre-rendered stuff on it. Um, and then, you know, say you've got some routes, you would serve the page for the, the index.html for that. Um, and so on and so forth for the rest of the routes on your page. So you might be thinking, oh, well, that sounds really good, Wing. But how, what are the, what's the support for this strategy? Uh, React, it works, yes. Vue also works. Angular, luckily, yes. Uh, and insert any JavaScript framework, it, it will work, right? It, at the end of the day, it's just HTML. All we're doing is we're, uh, we're util it works because we're, util 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 utilizing web standards. Um, we're using the power of the browser to get a snapshot of your end state HTML. So if anybody ever tries to sell you something without at least mentioning some of the downsides, you should be extra suspicious, right? So here are some of the downsides. Uh, you would have increased build times, right? because you're, every time that you build or a, new, uh, a new version of your application, you're going to have to go in and pre-render everything again. Uh, increased time to interactive, I've gone through that. Uh, if you've got lots of routes, this might be a bit tricky. You might have to think of some creative ways to get around this, because uh, it's just going to get more and more unwieldy. Uh, and if you've got any dynamic kind of user-specific content, you're going to want to make sure that um, you don't, you, you put some placeholder content there so that it's ready to get swapped in once the JavaScript is ready. Uh, and so Ontario, all we had to do was just change one button to an to a anchor tag and everything was fixed, um, along a couple of other big things that we kind of did in the background. And so <laughs> other possible solutions for, for this problem, um, of course, you can go in and actually do server-side rendering. Uh, you can use kind of at edge services. There's some things out there like Cloudflare Workers, Lambda at Edge that will do things. Uh, you can run extra code right at the end uh, where your users are getting their pages served up. Uh, there's other service options that um, will let you run do, do similar things a bit earlier, and there's other actual cloud-based solutions that will pre-render and do all of this for you. So I'm not here to preach the one true way to do things, but like I look at all of these options, and all I see is vendor lock-in. Right? I, you can surely you can use any individually, uh, any of these individually or a combination or whatever, but. Um, 
if we included this by default with Terrier, it would just drive up the cost of running a Terrier. So we wanted to make sure we shipped something that was open source by default. We wanted to you know, avoid vendor lock-in. We didn't want to make any additional external dependencies. Um, we didn't want to force any one platform onto our users. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that the app still kind of works even if they couldn't get whatever it is that we're running. Like this is all progress, uh, if all falls back nicely. Um, and so yesterday I did a demo. Today I'm gonna do another live demo. Um, no tech talk is nearly as exciting without something that can crash and burn. So we're gonna try and do that now. And so this is a Terry map that I need to put on the other screen. Uh, display settings. I'm kind of, yeah, I'm going to need to see it. That's all right. I think I've got it. You can switch back, I think. Yes, thank you. Right, so this is a Terry map. Uh, it runs things. You can... We can put things on the map, and given good internet connection, we can, okay, so it's a map, it, it visualizes things. Uh, but that's not what we're interested in here today. Uh, I'm gonna go wild, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our tools here and actually just turn off JavaScript completely. We don't need it anymore. It's 2019, who needs JavaScript? So, <laughs> so you can see that our single page app that runs in JavaScript is uh, it still kind of works. I can still click into all these pages uh, and we can see what the content is, right? Uh, this is essentially what you see as a web crawler or, a, or as a search engine. And this is uh, one really good way to kind of verify that it works because you've turned off JavaScript but you can kind of still see everything on the page. All the content here can be indexed uh, and it's just not kind of tucked away, it's not hidden. So. That's all I had for you today. Uh, I have a booth. Uh, let's have less of the left side, more of the right side. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Thank you. Hey, great talk. Um, been working a bit recently with um, using structured data uh, to represent the metadata of data sets and web pages. Have you thought a lot about how you might use something like JSON LD uh, to support further SEO of your data sets? That is a tricky question. Uh, when you say structured data, you mean like structured metadata? That, that kind of yeah, okay. So yes, you can absolutely do that. That will help you um, give structure to the, the data that you're serving up. Uh, but it, you, you s you're still gonna have the same problem uh, of not, so, not having that structured data available for all of your pages unless you configure your web server to serve up that given structured data for every page on your single page app. Uh, so yes, that would still work. You just have to do it a different way because you're not uh, you're not making it uh, available on, on every page, right? Uh, one other quick question. <laughs> Hello. So Hi. does it work? Does Google yeah. now index <laughs> all of your data? Sorry, does it work? Does meaning? Google now all index all of your data sets? Yes, it does. I will show you that now all of our data sets are indexed by Google, and I'm not gonna shame myself into showing a Terrier map that isn't running this, because it will just be like the slide that I had where right. it's just a page in there. Um, but yes, all, all hundreds of data sets that we've added for this particular map, it works. It's all cool. there. Yes, so it all still works once the JavaScript is loaded in. It, it's still an interactive app, as if nothing changed. It's just a little bit, the search engines will just see it a little bit differently, in that they can actually see it. It's not, you know, not accessible to them. 